Frank Bruno was born in Hammersmith and grew up in South London. As a boy, he was big for his age and found trouble without trying. And he drove his God-fearing parents to distraction. I was um, full of energy sort of kid, you know what I mean? Um, always into something that I shouldn't be into rather than going to school to learn the golden rule. I was a little bit of a bully when I was at Sofield School, so I got myself in a lot of trouble with the parents and things like that. When he was going to school, I can assure you that every day you would get a phone call from school that Franklin is in a fight. After a fracas with a teacher, he was expelled from primary school and sent to Oak Hall, a reform school in the Sussex countryside. It was just as well. The neighbours were getting nasty. They were threatening to kill him and to kill um, us. It was a very scary place going there. A very, very scary place at night time especially because um, certain things were done and you had to get done and if they said you had to do it and you didn't do it, you know what I mean, you'd come, come into a meeting. I had a letter once from his music teacher at this school in Rye and uh, he said that, uh, he said to me that Frank was one of the best pupils he'd ever had. He said, because the music used to drop down behind the piano all the time, and Frank was the only boy big enough to move the piano so they could get at their music. <laughs> Frank started boxing when he was eight. It would make him rich and keep him out of trouble. When I first came to the Earl's Field Boxing Club, it, it helped me quite a lot, because I had a lot of energy and a lot of tension, and, and, and I hated the world, you know what I mean? So it controlled me. It calmed me down and put me on the right road to where I needed to go, you know? When he returned from Oak Hall, Frank picked up his amateur career and won the ABA heavyweight title at 18. Soon after he turned pro, Bruno was confronted by four skinheads in East London. And Cass Pennant, then a notorious football hooligan, came to his rescue. The old joke with black guys, yeah. Um, is look at their legs, yeah, we've all got chicken legs. I've never seen a black guy with muscles coming out of his knees. The first link to me knowing it was Frank Verner was Colin Hart announced to the world that Terry Lawless thinks he's, he's found the British world heavyweight champion. I realised that Lawless had a, you know, a lot of work to do with him in the gym, but obviously the potential was there. Six foot three, 15 and a half stone and 20 years old. I've been eating good food, training. Every night I go to my bed, I say, I'm going to be the world champion. And I think I, if by the time I'm 25, I, I think I should be the world champion by the time I'm 25, you know? Frank won his first 21 professional fights, all of them inside the distance. Frank's strengths were his power. He had a massive right hand that could knock anybody out. But some of his opponents were very ordinary. The criticism I had at the time, and I, I haven't changed my mind, is that some of those fights didn't teach him anything at all. Slower, fatter, smaller used to be the motto. But then there was a wake-up call against Jumbo Cummings, a tough ex-con with a big right hand. When he was hit and hurt, he was terribly vulnerable. His hands would come down, his chin would go up, whereas you know, most fighters would, would hold on or grab or pull and, and, and the referee would say, break, and they'd hold on for their dear life to clear their head or run away. He didn't have the ability to do that. James Bone Crusher Smith lost every one of the first nine rounds against Bruno and then did this. And the fight's all over, I think. Now, there were real doubts. I've got beat, I've got beat. You know, a lot of people might be laughing out there. I'm glad he got his. I think I'm glad he got his. You know what I mean? Nobody backside laughing. kick. But you know, I'll be back, Harry. Six easy wins got Frank back on track. Then a spectacular knockout of South African Jerry Kutzia earned him a shot at the world title. There, for much of the ride, was Harry. He was a godsend to the commentator. From my point of view, from my working point of view. He was the sort of successor to Muhammad Ali, and I was very, very glad to have him. I can remember when I, I, I interviewed him after the Bugner fight, and we had that on ITV as opposed to most of his fights being on the BBC, and um, he came over to me, and, and I went to ask him a question. He went, hold on, where's Harry? 
Just tell us about your view of how the fight finished. Um, well, it's difficult to say. Harry. Just be coming yeah. up here with a bit of luck, Frank. Where's Harry anyway? <laughs> <laughs> you like characters. You, if you're working in this business, you, you, you want characters. You don't want plain ordinary people who never got anything to say for themselves. The crazier they are, the better. <laughs> Not that Frank was crazy, but it was nice if you know if you could get a bit of fun out of them. Hello, Jim. I mean, Harry. Nicola, how's the training going? Great, Harry. Great. Do you think if I eat champion soft grain, I'll grow up like you? No, I don't think so, Harry. Bruno's first title fight was against streetwise champion Tim Witherspoon who won the war of words before the fight. After the weigh-in, I went back and said, you know what, you never been where I've been, I'm gonna knock your ass out. I'm from the streets. And then when I seen, I seen it in his eyes, I said, oh, I got him a little bit. You know, cause when I said it, he like, put his head down a little bit, and got a little scared of me. For about seven or eight rounds, he was looking really good. But he tied up. Frank got really anxious and a lot of nervous energy kicked in. I was a young guy coming up, hungry, strong, and wanted to go. And I think I could have been a little bit more seasoned before I went in with Tim Witherspoon. Oh, on the top of the head, the left hook. He started to go to pieces in the corner. And he's breaking up a bit now. And he's hitting him on. He's down. He's got to get him up. And the towel has come in from Terry Lawless's corner. Come out looking like E.T got beaten up very, very badly, and um, I've done well for a number of rounds, and you know, we just conked out, and he just, his experience just, just um, overwhelmed me. After that loss, Frank changed his trainer and brought in George Francis, who'd worked with many world champions. He was one of the most nicest guys you could ever wish to meet. He was a good trainer. He ran with you, he stayed with you, he was a good guy. I had a lot of time for George, I, I liked him, you know what I mean, he became a good friend. George would be in Frank's corner for the next ten years, in good times and bad. And he was there when he got his second title shot, against Mike Tyson in Las Vegas in 1989. Tyson was out of control, his marriage was on the rocks, he was brawling in the streets, the fight was postponed five times, none of that would help Frank. Tyson's that train wreck or that car crash that you shouldn't look at, you shouldn't rubberneck, you should just keep driving on, but you just can't help it. Don King has tried to make Mike Tyson out to be Superman, but I got kryptonite to beat him. Thank you very much. Tyson was a fearsome fighting machine who wanted and liked hurting people. Normal heavyweight would hit you with one, uh, Tyson would hit you with three, four, five, six, just in, in a flash. It was personal in there, with it, and you feared for Frank. Well, I'm not a hostile person, basically, but he's in some trouble, yeah. Thousands followed Bruno to Vegas, hoping he could pull off an upset. Frank Bruno's chances of beating Tyson was just as good as anybody else's because he could punch. If you can punch, you've got a chance in any fight. And when he went in with Tyson, he had a puncher's chance. That was a Bruno that people wanted to see, because he wasn't scared. If you watched the way he was looking at Tyson, thinking, yeah, and, and, I didn't watch it. I stayed at the hotel and pray. It was almost over before it had started. And Tyson starts with a fury and Bruno tries to punch back. Bruno down. He caught me and I think at the side of the head and I went down, the legs went, you know, with nerves a little bit and a good punch and whatever, but I got up pretty quick, too quick in fact. Sometimes when you, you get hit hard, go down. Take eight, go down, look at your corner. I felt that people perhaps might underrate Frank's ability to punch. Even Tyson might underrate that. He's hurt Tyson! He's hurt Tyson! So when Frank suddenly got him with the right hand, I was so excited by what I'd seen that I did shout out, Get in there, Frank! Because I could see that he might finish it there and then. He rocked for a little bit, but, you know, I mean, as dangerous good fighters always do when you rock them, they come back very, very dangerously, and he came back very dangerous against me. He can say that I didn't really follow up, but I shouldn't try and be in the ring with him and see 
and watch the tapes and see how I was trying. But you know, I mean, the more I tried, the more he survived. When he came back, he came back stronger. Only guts keeping Bruno up at this moment. There's blood trickling from his nose and his mouth. This is vicious punishment. That's that shot. That's that that that, that photo shot. And Beautiful Bitten shot. Steel has seen enough. I felt very terrible, you know what I mean? Because I really, really trained for it, really put my mind to it. Body, heart and soul dedicated myself for nearly a year. I felt very, very disappointed, very, very gutted. With defeat, Frank parted with his long-time mentor and manager, Terry Lawless. He wanted to come in my change room, didn't you? I did, I'm glad yeah, I did. I'm not that way inclined. But even after losing, the job offers kept coming. People seemed to love Frank, regardless, but others thought he was letting the black community down and labelled him an Uncle Tom, a white man's lackey. Spicy tomato. I wish I could say the same for Friday. You still can't get my name right. Pass the sauce, Harry. Add variety to life with the spicy sauces from HP. I had a lot of people come from Brixton and say, beat, beat him up. So I said, something wrong here. I said, something wrong here. You telling me to beat your guy up and you from England. Frankly, I'm not HP. It was the way they molded him into that figure where that... The old grannies are going to love him. Everybody's going to love him. They don't want him to have an attitude. Oh, Greasy, do you think we should get this fella on a panel? Who? Oh, this man. What, for Clough, Keegan and Shannon? Yeah, to look after them. Bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> Some would say that I can act like that if I want to act like that, you know what I mean? If I'm in a situation, I can act like that, but I'm me. And I'm always going to be me, whoever, whoever wants to call me whatever, you know what I mean? So I don't understand what they mean by Uncle Tom, you know what I mean? I don't understand it at all. When he went off the rails, I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was very sad. And I know that definitely, definitely affected him mentally. Frank married Laura Mooney in 1990. There'd been snide remarks about the black boxer and the white girl from West London, but now, as his manager as well as his wife, she'd play a big part in his career. I think that a lot of Frank's success was due to the fact that she was there and she was driven and she would motivate him and push him. She's two people. She's such a down-to-earth, ordinary girl that anyone can knock out and get on with her. Then she's this other character. That's the character Frank's terrified of, absolutely terrified of. There's a side to her that I don't find very pleasant, but that's my opinion. But uh, she's certainly been a great influence on his life and made a good, great contribution to his life. A lot of people think she was a pain in the backside, but um, I think she's just trying to look after her man. But she still said, bring out the check, still give me a clap around the head and said, bring out the check. <laughs> Club's still waiting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Racial tension marred Frank's next world title fight against another Black Britain. The Lux Lewis means more to me than the WBC Championship. This is one of the most famous losers in England. But I do think deep down, and uh, I know Les would never admit to it, that I think he was jealous of the popularity of Frank Bruno. Bruno had accused Lewis of calling him an Uncle Tom. But when Bruno's lawyers issued a writ on the eve of the contest, Lewis's manager, Frank Maloney, tore it up. The matter was later dropped, but the bad feeling remained. I was really impressed with how Frank was beaten with the jab. Frank never fought better than he did that rainy night in Cardiff. Like the Witherspoon fight, he was ahead on points. Thankfully, I think it was round seven, he found the punch that we needed. But again, it ended in agony. And suddenly, Bruno's on the receiving end. He's defenceless. And is Lewis turning this round. The fight's all over in the seventh round. Lewis had the belt and tried to patch it up with Frank afterwards. I felt that uh, Bruno was a lot better than uh, people credit, gave him credit for. He came in in terrific shape and, you know... But Laura was having none of it. And I went to... It's all over now, Laura. Let's forget everything and... She sort of looked at me and just spat, spat back in my face at me. Bruno teamed up with Frank Warren as his career entered its final stages. Warren did business with American promoter Don King and they would get Frank one last shot at the title. 
Oliver McCall had been in and out of crack houses since he was a teenager. He was a dangerous, foul-mouthed champion and threatened to put Frank in a wheelchair. All the things that he was saying, you know what I mean, you put in a, in, in a box somewhere and sometimes open up that box and sometimes gives you a little bit more inspiration, a bit more determination. All the time lucky and I can't wait to shove my fish right down that guy's gob, you know, because there's some garbage coming out of his gob. I just can't wait to shut him up. The atmosphere was electrifying and um, I just had a feeling that Frank was going to win this one. It was a scrappy fight, but Frank wanted it. He always seemed to lack stamina, except the McCall fight. Not many people know this, but in the first round of the McCall fight, Oliver caught Frank's glove and it, it grazed the eye. So he fought through that, that fight in considerable discomfort. Bruno had only been the distance once before. Now he'd have to do it again. The objective was to get Frank through those later rounds. And if you see the fight, Frank sort of holds all, you know, inside he ties McCall up and frustrates him. It was very, very difficult because the guy gets stronger as the fight goes on, them two rounds, was like going an extra six rounds. He holds on and grabs and tries to buy precious moments here as McCall looks for the one big punch which could yet win him this contest. And Bruno hears the final bell and he believes that he is champion of the world. I thought I won it, yeah, yeah, I, I thought I won it, but anything is happening in boxing. I was happy for him, I really was, and I tried to pick him up. I didn't think that I could lift Frank Bruno up. In favor of the winner and new WC Heavyweight I've said to him many times since, why did you do that? After I'd retired, why the hell didn't you do it when, when I was working? Not being funny, I don't want to sound like I'm crazy or nothing like that. It was a beautiful feeling. It was about a million orgasms. Felt tall, felt good, felt proud, felt, felt... Privileged. He was crying after the fight. He couldn't believe it himself. He just could not believe that he, you know, he finally got that belt strapped round him. It was tough in there. It was tough, man. But I done it. You know, it's hard to hard to sort of put it into words because I'm busted up at the moment. But I'm just over the moon, man. I'm happy. You know. Don't worry about that, Frank. It's an emotional moment. Uncle Tom, man. No way. I love my brother. I'm not Uncle Tom. This Uncle Tom thing with him was it was there. You know, won a world title. I'm not an Uncle Tom. Not very great on the world yet. I'm not an Uncle Tom. I'm telling you, that was in his head. In 1995, Frank Bruno was on top of the world. At last, the nation could love him for being a winner, not just a good loser. But after striving for 13 years to reach the top, his happy days wouldn't last long. To get to McCall, he'd had to agree to defend the title against Tyson. And after injuring his eye in the McCall fight, he shouldn't have even been in the ring. He got through a medical, mainly by George Francis, trying to distract the guy who was doing the examination. And they never properly saw the extent of the damage uh, on Frank's eye and, and um, passed him fit to fight. Whether he did have a problem, I don't know if he did, and he went into that fight, that was a very stupid thing to do. I looked at my eye and thought something was a little bit fishy and just um, laughed my way through. He was getting well paid to the fight, there's no doubt about it, but, you know, your health comes before... You know, you want to be able to see the money, don't you? Mike Tyson was rampant again. He'd served three out of six years for rape and was three fights into his comeback. And even though he was the challenger, was paid five times as much as Bruno. At the end of the day, four million pounds against 30 million dollars. You know what I mean? If I was to say I was happy, you'd say I was a liar. I'm not happy, but at the end of the day, I'm not a greedy person. I'm contented and I'm very, very grateful for getting the opportunity. I think Bruno has a real chance too. I think, I think he has two, Slim and none. And Slim's out of town. 7,000 Bruno fans had come to Las Vegas to see Frank spank the Yank. But behind the scenes, trouble was brewing. In the dressing room, Frank uh, seemed, you know, really relaxed. He was so charged up for it. And I, and I was sitting, and as I'm sitting there, I'm looking at him, and then suddenly the knock came on the door. Dressing room, time to go, it's show time. And I turn around and he just looks a different guy. Remember the camera on him as he walked towards the ring? 
and he looked like a beaten fighter even before the first bell rang. And as he walked out, he kept crossing himself. And that look on his face, I knew he was, you know, we're leaving the belt here. I just knew that was going to happen. The thing just wasn't balancing, the things weren't really tallying up together, so the walk to the ring was very scary. You had Tupac Shakur, you had all them doing all this, all intimidating Frank, all of them, all of them. And I was with the Frank, with, with the flag, and I think, whoops, <laughs> you're on your own, Frank, and I'm without. I'm telling you, it's very intimidating fighting in Vegas. The guy that led before he even got in the ring, he already lost the fight. Don't call it a comeback. first gift, yeah, he didn't deliver, yeah, and he felt more than his own pain of losing, he couldn't deal with the feeling that he let down all the British people. I felt sorry for all the fans that come over there, but most important thing is me, I, I didn't feel right, it just felt terrible. He knew the consequences, he knew he couldn't box again, he knew he was lucky to be in the ring that night anyway, and he knew also that, that it was over, that it was gone. Bruno left Las Vegas an ex-champ and an ex-boxer. Soon his life started to unravel. Drugs, suicide and divorce were to push him over the edge. I heard that he was smoking a lot of shit. I heard he was uh, putting some stuff up his nose as well. We felt a relief that we'd finally done it. And all of a sudden the mood changed when we were in the hospital. I said, what do you mean, shut up? You shut up. And then I, as I went to him, they all grabbed me and put something in my backside. When I look on the television, I see that gate open. That really, really broke my heart. The full story of Frank Bruno's mental breakdown continues after the ITV News. Story continues. You're fucking man. Charles coming! We're leaving the belt here. In 1995, Frank Bruno was king of the boxing world for six months. Then his life came crashing down. He lost his title and almost lost his mind. Doing drugs and desperately ill, in September 2003, he was sectioned under the Mental Health Act, suffering from bipolar disorder, manic depression. Two years on, this is Frank's story. Bipolar disorder, or as it used to be called, manic depression, is one of the most serious mental illnesses, alongside schizophrenia. It's an illness where a person can lose touch with reality, where they can literally become mad. Patients, if you like, swing between two uh, mood poles. Uh, one of these mood poles is the patient feeling very low and depressed, and the other mood pole is the person, uh, patient feeling quite uh, high. They often go out and buy a great deal of things. They use up the credit cards. They think life is creative. They're full of energy. And then there's a terrible descent, the descent into the dark, dark ocean within themselves. And that is a terrible, terrible place to be. For the first time since he was a boy, training every day on the streets of South London, aged 34 and retired, Frank had no direction in his life. Boxing is, 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 a, is a business you give everything, you give every ounce of your soul to it. And when, well, when it's over, there's nothing, there's nothing that can replace it. We weren't skilled in either profession. 
I tried pantomime and do different TV work here and there, but it could never, you know what I mean, fulfill what I, you know what I mean, had the buzz in boxing. For people like Bruno, and I see it so often, it's, you know, it's, you're left with this huge void and nothing replaces it. In November 97, wife Laura obtained a court order banning Frank from assaulting, molesting or harassing her. She didn't accuse him of hitting her, but the words hit him like a left hook. Married for seven years and together for 16, they were sports golden couple. But today, the door of the Grunos' home in Essex remained firmly closed. It's not something that you want, um, but I think people understand that he was going mentally through a terrible, terrible time. Uh, I personally believe that perhaps she, she didn't help that situation. The following year, Bruno was diagnosed as suffering from bipolar disorder, but Frank didn't understand how ill he was. They were telling me I had all different things. I was acting very, very strange, but I wouldn't really, didn't li listen to him. You know what I mean? Didn't listen to him at all. You know, I was supposed to take some tablets, but I didn't take them. Well, I started taking them, but I'd, after a while, I just carried on training, doing whatever I got to do, carrying on in my life, and I didn't really realize how, what about the manic depression was, you know? I didn't even understand. In 2001, Frank appeared on the TV show Celebrity Sleepover. Everything about that show, I cringed. Especially if a man goes out and works yeah. and brings something and puts corn on the table, he must have a little bit of respect in his own house. Yeah, but I mean, it's but not... But in my house, I ain't got one ounce of bit of respect. That's the really? only thing that hurts my heart. What people don't realise was the day before, yeah, the divorce papers landed on the kitchen table. You're going to shout at me again, Frank? Have I shouted at you no, once? No, I'm only joking. Yeah? You well, me. your joking is a very, very strange Yeah, I'm humor, a Georgie, you know, I can't problem. help it. I don't think it was a mistake. Wrong time for me to do it. Wrong, wrong, wrong time, but it wasn't a mistake doing it. The guy wasn't my cup of tea at all. But if he wants to push me like that, of course. If there was a bridge, I would have pushed him over. <laughs> the man is being around the world. You have very little to say to these places. There's a ball there, so I hit the ball. Okay, Next I'll hit question. the ball. It was devastating for him, but the one person didn't seem devastated was Laura. And to her, it was that last, none of you know the real Frank. I don't know why two people split up, but they did. But it wasn't the most amicable of splits, and it did affect Frank very badly. And she did get into his head. The legal fallout from the divorce means that today neither Frank nor Laura are able to discuss her involvement in his career or any aspect of their lives together. She's the mother of my kids, you know, and you don't spend um, 20 years with someone and not love them, and I always will love her. Separation or divorce is not an easy thing to do. And I think this contribute to his uh, mental illness. On top of that, in 2002, George Francis, his longtime trainer and friend, took his own life. Joan, his wife died of cancer, then his son Simon died of cancer. And um, did not mean didn't have nothing left, and he just got to him, you know. But that would have been the last person I would have thought would have done something like that. If you have a father figure in your life, and that one committed suicide, then uh, you know it would affect you. He used to sit in the corner of the room, and it's this image of this huge man. And even when he sat in a chair, the chair used to look so little. He just looked so big in everything. And he used to sit there and he used to stare. And he could sit there motionless for 10, 15 minutes. And noise and everything buzzing all around him. And he was this silent stillness. And he just, he, I used to look at him and think, I wish I could work out what was going on in your head. He was uh, living on his own in that huge mansion in Brentwood. And there were stories about him sleeping in the boxing ring rather than in his bedroom. And people then were saying, well, what's going on here? I went to his house and it was like a mess. And there was all these layabouts in there. I don't know who they were. People there, he'd, he'd gone and bought, like, I think it's it five or six uh, Toyota Celicas old cars, which were in the grounds. So he bought a load of caravans. And obviously people were going in there and taking liberties with him. I've been pushed aside out of his life then, last that year, as all his inner circle had and replaced by well-wishers who would give in to any of Frank's demands, not question 
and not question what he was doing. He'd have loads of people around the house, these Liverpudlians, <laughs> they were going to build this big school or health resort at Stondon Massey, and they wanted me to see the architectural plans. It all got a bit, a bit bizarre, really, a bit mad. There was all, you know what I mean, odd people that weren't, shouldn't have been there as well, you know what I mean? But unfortunately, that's the way I was, you know? When you're sick, you, you don't know certain different things, what's going on around you. And he's got a lovely big house out there, and his well wishes of living in there, and he's living in a little spot in the woods, you know? He felt no one could threaten him, he was at peace, yeah? There's only the birds whistling through the trees, a little tick of a spot in the woods, he would always go, so I always knew where to find him. For the first time in more than 20 years, Frank stopped training. Physically, mentally, he was falling apart. He thought the security services were plotting against him, and the drugs didn't help. Recreational drugs, specifically where bipolar dis disorder is concerned, uh, does not cause the disorder. It, of course, depends on the type of recreational drugs, and if you have more stimulant drugs, such as LSD, ecstasy, um, cocaine, they have a much higher propensity to worsen the illness in a very substantial way. I heard that he was smoking a lot of, sh a lot of shit. I heard he was uh, putting, putting some stuff up his nose as well. And uh, it was just, you know, crazy. I mean, what, you know, what was going on here? Years ago, I got warned against it. And it took me until I got about 36, 37. Odd to try it. But Frank had smoked dope since he was a teenager. I don't know if he ever had a puff before, but he certainly never had a reputation for, for that. And, he, and there's this guy who, you know, who was apparently was doing so much of it, it was, it was you know, doing his head. Each person, it, it affects differently, and I mean, it helped me relax a little bit too much. It can send you a little bit do lally, you know what I mean? Frank was now a prisoner of the night, DJing up and down the country. Days before he was sectioned, he appeared at the Opium Nightclub in Accrington. When he arrived, I think people were shocked. It was very hunched down and uh, very, very s sort of sweating, and, and he looked just totally out of it. I think he played the same record three times in the best part of, what, ten minutes? And he kept saying, you'll like this one. I thought, I've heard that one before. And they said, you'll like this one. <laughs> I thought, I've heard that one before as well. It was disturbing to see somebody I looked upon as a fantastic heavyweight boxer of England come out and perform in his condition. I thought it was absolutely disgraceful. I was just going through a, a, a weird sort of like different things. A lot of things that happened to me through the years were still in my mind and hurting me and biting me. And I was just taking it all in and absorbing it by myself rather than talking it out. He had a lawyer, and I said to the lawyer, can you get Frank? He said, I've got to say something which he's not going to like. And I said, Frank, you need some help. And he said, I know I'll need some help. I said, no, you need help. I said, you know, there's something wrong with you. You know, mentally, you're not there. I said to him, uh, why don't we let's take you to the Priory, let's get you in there and try and sort something out. So Frank said, uh, nothing wrong with me, you're fucking mad. I said to him, you're probably right. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll check in there with you and I'll have a week in there with you. And I quite meant that, you know, I'll go and just get, let's get him in there. You know, once he's there, he's there, isn't he? Frank stayed one night in the Priory. Soon, he'd have no say in the matter. When you see him, when he do come to visit, then you would see the change in him, you know. And I always pray that it didn't get that far, that he would seek help before it reached that they have to section him. I was supposed to go to Great Ormond Street Hospital and all of a sudden the police was knocking at the door and you know what I mean, the ambulance was out there, the press was out there, so everyone else knew before I knew. I got carted away to um, the hospital. On September the 22nd, 2003, Frank's family consented to him being taken into care. At the house in Stondon Massey, where ex-wife Laura, daughter Nicola, social services, an ambulance crew, and the police. 
the usual um, grounds for detaining someone under the Mental Health Act. The patient needs to be uh, at risk to himself or herself. Uh, the patient would need to uh, be at risk to other people. Confused, Frank refused to cooperate and he made a call to an old friend. He just said, can you come over? And I said, well, yeah, when I finish work, you know, I'm going to come over. He said, Cass, things are going on, I can't explain, I just need you here now. And he's getting a little bit agitated, yeah? I need you here to make sense of things, Cass. Can you come? Are you coming? I said, Frank, you know I'm always there for you. I'm coming now, mate. I'm coming now. He's the one that could handle me. He's not scared of me. He's a big lump like myself. And, you know what I mean? Sometimes I can reason with him, you know? Frank was fighting again, this time for his freedom. And he'd try anything. So I got out of the kitchen door, gone down the garden. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Yeah, Frank's got two officers in the ring, yeah? One's chucking a medicine ball at each other and Frank's trying to teach them a spot. And they've seen me and one of them's climbing around it's not him and gone, Cass, can't believe it, it's my dream. In the, in the ring with the world champion, you know? And I've gone, oh, oh, not a day, boys, you know? But Frank's moods were swinging wildly. He was on the edge. One minute charming, the next abusive. I apologised to the police for insulting them and calling them all the names under the sun. But at the time, just the, the liberty of them coming into your house and said, Section 2, we're coming to take you away. You know what I mean? I didn't like them just coming to my house and tell me I had to get, go somewhere. It took more than six hours to get Frank into an ambulance. But finally, he was on his way. When I look on the television and see that gate open, could you imagine how I felt? That really, really broke my heart. He was driven by ambulance for treatment at a London psychiatric hospital after police were called to help paramedics remove the ex-boxer from his luxury Essex home. I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, it was a long drive. You know, I mean, there's press outside. There's press when you got to the hospital, and it was very, very not scary, but you know, I mean, a depression. Not, not a nice time to be taken away in the ambulance. We felt in relief that we finally done it. And all of a sudden, the mood changed when we were in the hospital. We're in a four-star hotel, you know what I mean, with the beach at the back or anything like that. It was like a film going into the hospital. We weren't really my cup of tea going in a place like that, you know what I mean? Patients can be quite angry. They may not necessarily engage, um, if you like, uh, with the tree, uh, team that are trying to help them. I was moaning and groaning and whatever, and, then, and one of the nurse men, nurse, says, shut up. I said, what do you mean, shut up? You shut up. And then uh, as I went to him, they all grabbed me and, you know what I mean, put me on the floor and whatever, and put something in my backside, not Barrymore style, that injection in there, you know? And they gave me something to make me sleep, but when I got up in the morning, it was just painful. It was horrible getting up and meeting this one and meeting that one and this one screaming and that one walking. Yeah, I feel... F oh, he was just... F it was horrible, 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 horrible. It was hard the first day. Very, very hard, man. Very, very hard. Frank entered a twilight zone of strong medication, but accepted that it was the only way to beat his illness. After a week, I started to feel better, but the drugs they were giving me were so powerful that, you know what I mean, sometimes they're making me worse in a way, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know what they were giving me, what, but they were powerful sugar. Frank speaking to me, and I just wanted to basically cry, right? Because he's not speaking to me, he's speaking like a zombie. Yeah, and I just felt, what have I done? We went there and he was just very, uh... You know, it, it was sad, but it was the best thing for him. It was getting him out of the clutches of all these people that were around him, and it was, and, and it was. I think the job then was to try and, you know, get him well and hopefully get him some self-esteem back. The nurses there were very, very nice. They were very, very helpful. You know, I mean, they'd seen it all before. You know, I mean, with different people coming in now. One minute they might be in there 28 days. One minute they might be two months. One, three months, six months, and they keep on coming in now. I wanted to escape, but that was only escape mentally rather than physically, because I know if I would escape, I would have gone into 
a much more worse place that I was in, a very secure sort of like unit for different people, so I didn't want to go in the worst one that I was in, so I was soon quieting down. I'm all mouth sometimes, you know what I mean? I didn't really want I wanted to escape, but where am I going to go if I escape? Can't go to no airports, can't go to no ports, can't try and go to someone's house and chill out and whatever. I just, I, every day was a fight for me mentally to just, to just get on with it, tick off the days, get on with it, tick off the day, tick, tick off the days. Something in my brain just told me just to sharpen up and iron out all the creases and get myself together and um, polish up myself and pull myself together. Frank would be in good maze for 28 days. I was just waiting outside, looking at the window, looking at the window. And when my daughter came, man, I just, I, I just, bam, 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 bing! You know what I mean? You know, you're mad. Jeez, when I got out there, man, you thought um, Linford Christie was fast when he was at his peak. But Linford Christie couldn't touch me that day, man. Couldn't touch me that day. His daughter, Nicola, drove him back home to Stondon Massey. But the house was empty and full of old memories. Two years on, Frank has sold up and moved on. And he's currently staying at a health resort, owned by friend Stephen Perdue. I just felt that through all the things he'd been through, I felt sitting on your own, four walls, wasn't what he wanted to be doing, and I offered him to come and stay here. And I, and I have to say, you can see the, see the progression. Frank now has a routine on which to focus and keep the illness under control. I keep taking my tablets. You know what I mean? I go to gym mostly every day. I try and have a steamer, a sauna. I try and swim. I try and walk. I try and eat healthily. I try and go to bed early. And I try to do the right sort of like things, what you, you should be doing, you know what I mean? Basically, he's a prisoner of the gym. He has to keep training like this pretty much for as long as he can to ward off these demons that, that come back at him when, when he doesn't train properly. In the UK, one in 20 people suffer from serious depression, but the illness is still taboo. The Sun newspaper caused outrage with its infamous headline, but following a nationwide backlash, they ran a campaign to raise public awareness. But there is still a long way to go. One of the um, greatest tragedies uh, for me as a psychiatrist is the great stigmatization uh, that occurs in the popular press from people who essentially suffer from a medical condition. Bipolar disorder is complex and has many causes. Stress, substance abuse and loneliness can trigger what used to be called manic depression. But there is no known connection between the illness and boxing. I think Frank Brunez handles his illness with typical bravery, with openness. He could easily have hidden away, or he could have made more fuss about it. He, he said it for what it was. I had this breakdown. I was full of rage. I fought out against the people offering me treatment. I don't want all of you to do the same, because we need to accept mental illness. And that's been very courageous. You can tell on the phone that he's getting back to his old sharp wit. You know, people say, what's the real Frank like? And I just say to everyone, he's twice as funny as what you see on telly, yeah? You know, he's a natural comedian. We used to go out for dinner or, or sit up after the show, and he would tell me things about his life that he he'd never, ever spoken about, things that, maybe things about boxing. He told us stories about Don King and, and all that kind of thing. He, he'd never talked about before, and it was like he wanted to talk about it, like he had all this inside him and he, he was now prepared to let us be part of it. What I wish for Frank Bruno in future is peace of mind. I think that's what he needs, peace of mind, and to find some happiness. He's given his all for people. He's put his life on the line. I'm not joking. Boxers put their lives on the line every time they go in the ring. And he's given boundless pleasure to people over many years. Maybe get another woman one day, you know, because my right hand is getting very blistered. <laughs> get a good woman that I could service, you know, give her a good MRG, tea, oil change, and etc., etc. And, you know, what I mean, watch the kids grow up, 
you know what I mean? Try and duck and dive here and there. If I can try and make someone happy, try and make someone happy. But the most important thing is to make myself happy. Well, another boxer searching for happiness or at least a chance to avenge